Amen. Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. It is good to be with everybody this morning. I'm excited to be sharing God's word with you. And um, I'm excited to see just so many of you uh, face to face. I know it's been a while, but uh, as that last verse said in the uh, presentation, how good is it when the brothers live together in unity, right? It is like oil dripping down Aaron's beard, right? It is, it is, it is a sweet smelling fragrance to God when he sees that we have unity. Uh, two quick announcements before we get into the message. Uh, so as we normally do every year, we're going to be having a thankful service. And yeah, amen. It's going to be on November 15th. So in two Sundays, we're going to have a thankful service. And so I know you're thinking, well, Fenton, don't you know what year it is? I mean, I mean, it's 2020. Is there really anything to be thankful for? 2021? <laughs> to be thankful that 2021 is almost here. But no, I think that our God has been faithful, as we sang about earlier today, that in Christ alone, we have been able to find our strength, even through a pandemic, even through a tough time, even through some solitude and, and loneliness. And so we're going to have our thankful service. Amen. So for those of you that don't feel yet comfortable coming, but would still like to participate, uh, we'd like to invite you uh, to record a one minute video, no longer than one minute, of just what you're thankful for in 2020. What are you thankful for in your life and your family for what God has done? And um, I'll, you can contact me, I'll be able to get that from you. If you need help, need somebody to come and record you doing that, uh, just reach out to me. We would still like you to be able to participate in our thankful service. So uh, in two weeks, we're gonna have our thankful service. Um, secondly, just one other quick announcement about Sunday services. So uh, as you uh, probably got the invite, if you read your bulletin, uh, <laughs> you are invited to come. So starting really next week, um, you will no longer have to RSVP. I don't know, Rebecca's super thankful uh, for that. <laughs> um, uh, but when you come, we will still be required to come a little early. We ask you to be here around 930 so we can take everybody's temperature. Uh, you, sti you still need to wear your mask. And we are still going to spread out, okay? So we do still need to keep our physical distancing. I don't like to use the term social distancing because I don't want to be socially distanced from anybody. Not even Notre Dame fans, you know, that, that beat up on my school yesterday. Or Clemson fans that beat up on us in the worst home loss I think we've ever had, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So I don't want to be socially distant, okay? But to protect those of us, right, from what's going on. We're not going to ignore it. We still do need to do some physical distancing. So you don't have to RSVP, but you can still show up. Please show up early enough so we can take your temp and get you seated accordingly. Um, one change we are going to be making, uh, so, or two changes. Uh, anyone is welcome, including, uh, now previously we didn't let you bring younger kids. You are able to bring even preschool children now. A few caveats with that. We're going to be sending out some information. Uh, the CDC basically says you need to really talk to your doctor if your kid is from zero to four about if they need to be out and about and around people. Okay, so uh, Rebecca and I are going to be sending out some information to all our Creation Station families about that. Um, so you can make an, an informed decision with your family and your doctor about that. Again, if they do come, remember we've got cameras, live service. I mean, it's just like regular church. But right now we don't have children's class. So that means they are going to be with you at your seat, and you need to, you know, keep your, your kids in check, keep them in rain, so on and so forth. Uh, so know that uh, uh, children of all ages are welcome, with one exception. So one of the things that our COVID committee decided is on the first Sunday of each month, they basically want to have what we're, gonna, what we're calling a, a no-kid service for the sake of those who are maybe older, in more compromised categories, you know, the, the, the research is really showing that they are very susceptible to, to being around teenagers and young children. And so the first Sunday of every month, starting in December, is uh, no one under the age of 21 even, okay? No one under the age of 21 can attend those services. All adults are still welcome. All adults over 21 are still welcome those days. Um, but uh, that is a decision that we made uh, based on the current research and with our COVID committee. Uh, so as we're talking about unity, I want to say one quick word about our COVID committee. Uh, someone pointed out to me recently, Fenton, I don't even know who's on the committee. And so who's making these decisions and, you know, why are they doing this and that and who are they? And so I wanted to, they said, you know, is it sort of some secret group, you know, like the Illuminati or something? <laughs> um, and I said, no, you know, and I just wanted to apologize. We weren't trying to keep it a secret from you you know, or anything like that. Um, so I did uh, talk to the committee and they are happy to let you know on the committee is myself, uh, Jim Hanna, 
Robert Lingle, Annette Kirsting, Paul Kirsting, and Tiffany Welch. So we've got some people with like an insurance background, some folks from the board, some folks from the leadership team, and of course, two nurses, all right, helping us to make these decisions, all right? So um, if you have questions about things, please just come see me. I'm not scary, right? Even though I was born on Halloween, right? Uh, 40 years old now, uh, I am not scary. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a man, I'm 40 now, right? <laughs> uh, come see me if you have questions about things. We'll be happy to answer them for you, okay? Um, you know, unity is not easy to achieve. In fact, I'd like to put before you that in the world, unity is impossible. I mean, when you really think about it, on about any issue or any situation, there's always somebody that's contrary. Think about this. We just had, you know, uh, Zeta, the hurricane come through, and a lot of po people had power out, and trees were down, and you're thinking, who, who would be happy about that? Who could be excited about that? Well, tree removal service companies were excited. <laughs> right? When you think about somebody getting married, and you, you, in your brain you're like, man, everybody should just celebrate. It's a beautiful thing to see two people become one flesh. Well, there's always somebody out there like, I really wanted to marry that girl. Even you might think about the birth of a child. Everybody, of course, should celebrate a new life coming into this world. You ever heard of a thing called sibling rivalry? Why does that happen? Because suddenly they've got to share mom and dad with somebody else. And that's not even to start talking about government, politics, sports, or social issues. So a, a, a newsflash, if you're praying for world peace every day, you might as well stop. <laughs> it, it's, it, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but division. Because guess what? Jesus has a standard, and not everybody's going to agree with that. Now, he is, of course, the Prince of Peace, and he gives us peace in our lives, but the world itself will never be fully united. As a matter of fact, the one time we see in Scripture when it seemed like the world was all sort of united and on the same page, what happened? They tried to build a tower and make a great name for themselves and take the place of God. And so it is simply true that this world will never be united. But I'd like to put before you today that when it comes to God's people, unity is not only possible, it is expected, I dare say, demanded. God expects his people to be unified. I want to do a quick social experiment in unification here. So I'm going to start saying something. And as I start saying uh, this phrase, if you know it, I just want you to join in. Okay, so whether you're at home or here in the building, if you know what I'm about to say, just join in with me, okay? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen, Cornerstone. Even Remy knew it, right? Yes. So... Uh-oh, I went the wrong way. Can you pull the PowerPoint back up? Go to slide two. So the question is, how is that possible? <laughs> how is it possible that, you know, we've got all sorts of ages, colors, socioeconomic levels, and I'm sure both here and at home, lots of people were able to, able to do that. Why is that? How is that possible? Well, from age five to about 18, 180 days a year, as you start your school day, you recite that. And uh, it's a sort of inundation, I don't mean this in a negative sense, indoctrination, right, about this idea that we want the citizens of our country to value our country, to value our flag, to value the things that are, to value our values. And it's an attempt to sort of ingrain that in every citizen in this country. And so what can happen is, you know, you go 13 years doing that, and what it does is it builds a sort of bond, I'd say, or even a sort of thought process about the flag, about the country, so on and so forth. And what can happen is you can, you know, if somebody does something that offends you about that, it can create visceral reactions. So think about it. If you've ever seen those videos of somebody from another country 
burning an American flag. Your temperature may start burning when you see that. All I've got to say is the name Colin Kaepernick, and somebody in here is about to be upset. Because in your mind, his protest was a protest against the flag, even though that wasn't what it was about. That's what a lot of people took it as, right? When someone dies in the service of their country, they generally take a flag to the widow or the widower, or they'll drape a flag over the casket of certain soldiers. And so this idea of what it represents, it, 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 it creates and evokes an emotional response in us, either when someone does something for or against it. I'd like to say today that being a follower of Jesus demands a similar pledge. His calling, when Jesus says, come, follow me, is a call not only to salvation, it's a call not only to a good life or life to the full, but it is a call, what I like to talk about today, it is a call, it is a call for you to state this, I pledge allegiance to the king. I pledge allegiance to the one Lord. I pledge allegiance to Jesus Christ. So if you think about how the Gospels start, right, they start with both John the Baptist and Jesus saying, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the good news. Right? And so when you think about that expression and you think about actually the entirety of the gospel, really Jesus' whole message is about the kingdom. His whole message in all four Gospels, is that the king has arrived. Even the term gospel itself is a word that meant a herald or an announcement or a proclamation. So when Jesus is calling us to believe in that announcement, he's calling us to believe that, you know what, a new king is here and I need to pledge my loyalty. That's what the repentance part is, is you're saying, I am pledging my loyalty to this new king that was born. Uh, so there's a book, I, I, I recommend you all check it out. It's called Gospel Allegiance. It's by a guy by the name of Matthew Bates. And he basically looks at this word, the Greek word that we have for faith or belief. Pistis is the word. And he's done some research. And, and yes, in and of itself, the word can mean believe. As in, I, I do believe in fairies. Or I believe in unicorns. Right? But a stronger connotation of that word is actually when someone is faithful. When someone is loyal or have put their trust in someone, when someone has given allegiance to something. And so when Jesus says, believe in the good news, he's saying, give your allegiance to this gospel proclamation that a new king has been born. This isn't just about mental assent. When you think about saying somebody is faithful to their wife, you mean they're loyal to their wife. And so when we talk about believing in Jesus, the idea is, I have given my allegiance to Jesus. This week, I, I met a guy in a coffee shop. I was there for a, an appointment, a one-on-one, -on -one, and um, I was about to go, and I was reading this book, The Chronological Life of Christ, and um, I actually said to myself, okay, when my, when my appointment is done, I'm going to share my faith with this guy. Well, actually, he comes up to me, and uh, he starts talking. He's like, what are you reading? And then he starts, you know, asking me some religious questions, and I was like, oh, amen, I appreciate it. Somebody trying to share their faith. Amen. But very quickly into the conversation, he started talking to me about, do you believe in the doctrine of once saved, always saved? You know, because that's what the Bible teaches. And I said, well, you know, I don't think it's easy per se to lose one's salvation, but I don't believe that that is doctrinally true. And he started talking about me, well, all the Bible says is you just got to believe in Jesus. And I said, yeah, it does say that. And I started talking to him a little bit about this idea of what belief actually means in the first century. And I said, why don't you go look up these scriptures in Hebrews and 1 Peter as well. And, you know, one day I'd love to sit down and do a Bible study with you. And so we exchanged numbers and I texted him later and I was like, hey, did you look those up? You want to get together? I've heard crickets at this point. Uh, but the point being, so many people are out there with this misconception that it's just an idea of if I, if I sort of believe in Jesus the way I believe in Santa Claus that that makes me a follower. When it is so much richer, it is so much deeper, it is so much more meaningful when you understand the idea of saying, I believe in Jesus, is saying, I pledge allegiance to Jesus. So today we're going to be looking at three things that 
um, really talk about what it means when we say, I pledge allegiance to Jesus. We're going to be saying, I pledge allegiance to the king. And that means I'm giving my allegiance to the king's ethic. I'm giving my allegiance to the king's example. And I'm giving my allegiance to the king's edict. Let's start with the king's ethic. So we don't have time to go through the whole thing today, but if you've ever read the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain, you know, of all the sermons that Jesus surely gave in his life, traveling through synagogues, going throughout the land, right? He probably preached a lot of sermons. But the one that seemed to really stand out, I guess, to the Holy Spirit, the one that the the writers of the gospel were inspired to write down in several places, both in Matthew and in Luke, Matthew 5 through 7 and Luke 6, is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And what he's talking about there, I just, you know, it's kingdom talk. It is a literal code of Christian ethics. It provides real guidelines for the citizens of the kingdom to relate to the citizens of this world and to one another. To summarize it, he starts off with the Beatitudes or the blessings or the things that will make you happy. And he talks about being a peacemaker, right? Being, pers- being a thirsty and hungry for righteousness, right? Being a giver, being pure in heart, right? He talks about all these are the things that will truly make you happy. He also talks about some woes, the opposite of those things. If you do the opposite, these things will lead you to destruction and ruin. He goes on to discuss salt and light, saying salt, you, need, you are the salt of the earth. You're going to preserve the earth. You are the light of the world, right? You're going to give light to the world, And he finishes up talking about, you know, in my kingdom, under my reign, you are not to do things for show. Don't go pray on the corner just so everybody can see that you're praying on the corner. When you fast, don't disfigure your face and tell everybody you're on a fast. When you give to the poor, don't announce it with trumpets. He's saying, when you're under my reign, when you're under my rule, this is how we operate. This is how we interact. When you pledge allegiance to the king, we are agreeing to abide by these ethics. So um, earlier this week, um, just full confession here, I, I failed in this in a way. So a couple of the teams were going to play basketball. I went to pick up Mitch, and uh, we were meeting Jordan and uh, Hassan and Chris, and uh, we were going to play basketball up in Tequila. And, uh, you know, as I said, I turned 40 yesterday. And so something happened for the first time ever. I went out on a basketball court to play some pickup, and the nickname that the people were calling me out there was Pops. And, uh, you know, it was kind of interesting because when I think of Pops, I think of like John Witherspoon, you know, or, or somebody else, you know, somebody maybe, you know, somebody that's a grandpa you call Pops, not Fenton Gardner. I'm not Pops. So I was already coming in a little bit on edge. And then we're playing this team and we're getting killed. I mean, we're just, we're getting, we're getting killed, all right, in this game. And these guys, they're calling fouls a couple of times. And I really don't think some of them were fouls, but whatever, they're calling fouls. So finally, at one point in the game, I called a foul. Or they, they had gone back court, which if you know what that means in basketball, they had gone back court. And they basically said, well, we don't call that here. And so me and this guy that I was guarding, we basically start getting in an argument. And I'm like, do you even play basketball? Like, and I'm just, I mean, it's just, I was getting prideful. I was getting arrogant. I was getting heated. And I'm sitting there in front of Jordan and Chris Higgins and Mitch. And I'm like, I'm supposed to be the guy setting an example. (laughs) But I kind of lost my cool. And it gets to the point that we do this thing in basketball called the ball never lies. Where basically, if you, uh, if, you, if you have a disagreement about somebody about a call that they've made, then somebody gets to shoot it and it, from the three-point line. If they make it, then they're right. If they miss it, then you're right. So I'm like, do or die. Ball never lies. Let's go. And so this guy, who he had made a couple layups, but he had not made a jump shot all day long, made this three-pointer nothing but net. <laughs> and just kind of looked at me like, yeah, dude, you know? And, and, and it was so crazy. I was so humbled. <laughs> I was kind of embarrassed, but I was like, amen. But the point being is, after that whole situation, even at the end of the game, when I went to say good game to everybody or whatever, he, he walked off and, and, and there was disunity between me and this person because of my attitude, because of my pride, because of my having to be right. And what should have been an opportunity, because I remember when I was in the campus ministry, we would go out and play basketball, and after the game, what would we do? We would share our faith with the people we played with. 
well, that was going to be impossible after how I'd acted. That was going to be impossible after how I'd behaved. And it's not about me being perfect in front of non-Christians. You know, the gospel isn't simply a behavior modification program. But it's simply about if I've given my allegiance to the king, I'm supposed to operate a certain way. I'm supposed to say, if Jesus is my Lord, this is how we operate. I mean, even non-Christians in a lot of those situations just say, it's all right, bro, you got it. But I wanted to argue. Right. And so when we think about this idea of I need to follow the king's ethic because I've given my allegiance to him. How does that look in your personal interactions with Christians and others? Are you a peacemaker? Are you humble? Do you have to get your way? Right? Do you have to be first? Do you have to worry? Do you worry about everybody liking you? Because Jesus said, guess what? That's how they treated the false prophets. Right? And so this idea that we've pledged allegiance to the king means that we operate under his ethic. You know, you can't be the salt of the earth if you're always sugarcoating the message. (laughs) <laughs> like candy yesterday, Halloween, a lot of candy yesterday. And the thing about light, though, no matter how dark a room is, light will always shine. If you put it, no matter how dark it is, if you put a candle in there, there will be light in that room. And that is what we're meant to be. But we are only that way when we're operating under the king's ethic. Amen? Amen. So let's be committed to this idea. You know, we talk about memorizing scripture. I have a good friend of mine that recently memorized the Sermon on the Mount. You know, if there's a scripture we could ever memorize, and it was amazing. I think some years ago I saw a preacher by the name of Steve Johnson. He got up at a service, and he said, I'm going to preach the greatest sermon ever preached. And we were all like, okay, bro. <laughs> and he just literally he got up there and recited the entire Sermon on the Mount. Right? That would be an amazing thing for us to hide in our heart the same way we do the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. The second point is... We, when we pledge allegiance to Jesus, we pledge allegiance to the king's example. Look over in John chapter 13. The king's example, by and, by and large, is an example of love. Yes. It's an example of love for God, love for neighbor, and even love for enemies. Let's read in John chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, when it was time for supper, the devil had already put into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. So he got up from the supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing, you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And it goes on. Let's skip down to verse 12. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. But if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done for you. Truly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. The idea of giving allegiance to the king's example, meaning it means that we are going to be men and women of love. Love even for our enemies. See, one of the most astonishing things in all of scripture to me is the fact that Jesus gets up to do this and it says the devil had already put it into Judas' heart to betray him and Jesus still washes his feet. A little bit later, when they go around and Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me, none of them knows who it is. That means that Jesus never treated Judas any different. He never loved him any less. He never said, all right, everybody else can get the ability to cast out demons, but not you. Everybody else is going to get my full power. You'll only sort of have half of it. Nobody knew because Jesus was operating this idea that God is love. I'm going to show love. 
not just to the Father, not just to my friends, but like he talked about in that Sermon on the Mount, even to my enemies, such that he could pray on a cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing as they're driving nails into his hand. So we look at this idea of the king's example. We pledge allegiance to the king. That means we pledge allegiance to wash one another's feet. Appreciate what what Virgil and Tiffany had to share. I appreciate just the love that Cornerstone has has poured out to them. We need to be servants that will wash one another's feet. When you think about needs that are going on right now, the, 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 the king's example says, if you're in my kingdom, if you're under my reign, I need you to be my hands and feet and to take care of the people that I put in your life. A lot of trees went down, right? How many neighbors have I had the opportunity or have I taken the opportunity to go over and help? I told Natasha, we saw a, a couple right down the street and I said, we've actually never met this couple or I don't even know if it's a couple. I don't know who lives in the house, but a tree fell and it looks like on their car and on their house. And I said, honey, I'd love to do something for them. And she's like, well, you know, people might accept a meal because of COVID right now. What do you want to do? And she's like, why don't we just buy a gift card? And so we went and bought a gift card. And we just put on it, you know, to your neighbors from the gardeners. Because I just want to be a servant. I want to follow the king's example of seeing a need in front of me and taking care of it. Amen. And the thing about this, you know, with Jesus being both a servant and a king, sometimes we get the wrong idea about him. A couple years ago, there was a LeBron James commercial. And you may remember this. It was a Nike commercial. And he starts running. And as he's out running in Miami, people see that it's with LeBron James. And they just, they just start running with him. Right? Some other folks that were jogging, start jogging with them. Little kids hop on their bikes. And, and by the end of the commercial, it's like this huge crowd of people running with LeBron James. But the, the end of the commercial gets almost kind of weird when you really think about it. He gets to his house, and the gate's open, and then he turns around and says, stop everybody. And it's like this mansion, and he walks in and just sort of leaves everybody else out on the street. And so I get the idea they were going for, hey, you can run with LeBron James, right? But the ending almost seemed weird. It almost seemed like, but but remember, you can't really be close to LeBron James. And I think sometimes we can get that idea about Jesus. Because he's the king, we can feel like I can't be intimate with him. He's just a ruler, master, and commander, and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't really care about me at a deep emotional level. He's just here to tell me what to do. And that's a mistaken idea right? He wouldn't wash these guys' feet. I mean, that was a job for the lowest slave in the house, okay? This is the king really washing the servants' feet as if he's one lower than them, right? That type of God wants to have you around his table. I mean, that type of king actually wants to have a big banquet. There are so many parables where he says, invite everybody in, to come to my banquet. Jesus was known as a friend of sinners, of tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, even thieves on crosses. Jesus was known as a friend to these people. So please understand that Jesus, even though he's king, he wants to serve you. He wants to love you. He wants to be a friend to you. Now, the flip side is also true. Because Jesus has come to serve, I think sometimes people can look at Jesus and sort of take his kindness for weakness. And I think particularly in the West, in Western society, we, you know, I think sometimes we really truly forget that Jesus is king. We can almost get too buddy-buddy. And I, again, hear me when I say that. I'm not saying we don't need to be close to Jesus. Hear what I just said, right, about him wanting you around the table. But I think we forget that he's king. There's an article, if you want to go research it on the internet, it's called The Feminization of Christianity. I know that title alone probably triggered some people, but that's all right. Go read it anyway. And basically what, what, what it really talks about is this idea of, you know, when you look in the Bible in the first century, right, the, by and large, was it more women or, or men that followed Jesus? It was more men. They always talk about there were 5,000 women, men besides women and children, or, you know, a great number of men. And then they also had to go after and point, yes, also women came along. But when you look at the church today, generally, particularly here in the West, is it more men or women? Way more women. What happened? And this author's thesis is basically that uh, in about the 1300s, they took this language, this poetic language of the time, and started sort of applying it in this romantic way to Jesus in ways that the first century church never would. And we know it today as the idea of Jesus is my boyfriend. Byron, you remember that song, uh, that parody song, uh, the worship song song? 
<laughs> it's funny. It's this parody about, about current and modern day Christian music, right? And, and ultimately what they're saying is it's a lot of times some of the lyrics are very vacuous and they're kind of empty. And it's basically you took a, your relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend and just switched out the name for Jesus. You know, and that really, you can say, started in like the 1300s, right? And so what happened is a lot of men over time say, I don't relate to God in that way. And we've seen a cultural shift. And it's because I think it goes back to this idea, particularly in the West, that we're just so buddy-buddy that, you know, it's, 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 it's not how Jesus is the lover of my soul. And yes, does Jesus love us? Absolutely. But Peter would have never said that. Maybe. I don't know. I, I just don't. I can't imagine that. It's more of this idea. Yes, he's my friend. Yes, he loves me. Yes, he, he cares for me. He died for me. And I will follow him because he is my king. That's, that, I think that's what we got to get back to. Is it's a both and. Bema talks a lot about this. You got to bring both the Western and the Eastern thinking to the Bible. And I think we can sort of get pigeonholed into one or the other. And God wants to relate with us on both levels. And so we can't forget that Jesus is king, and we need to follow the king's example of love. And that means loving your neighbor, whether it's your uh, black neighbor, your white neighbor, your straight neighbor, your gay neighbor, your Republican neighbor, your Democrat neighbor, whatever. We need to follow this example of love because Jesus can hang out with prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners, and thieves. You can hang out with somebody that votes different from you. The final point is the king's edict. The king's proclamation, the king's mantra, the king's tagline. It's a simple sentence, three words. Jesus is Lord. That is the proclamation. There's a reason we say it at our baptism. Matter of fact, when you look at 1 Peter 3, he talks about baptism saves you. It's the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It's a pledge to leave your old life behind, to leave it in the waters of baptism, that I've given up that old life and I'm now operating under the king's example and the king's ethic and the king's edict. That there is a king and his name is Jesus. He's the son of God. And so when we think about this, uh, this phrase, Jesus is Lord, what does that mean to me? What does that mean to you? I think it simply means, as he often stated, that we need to leave things behind. Matter of fact, he said in Luke 14, if you're not willing to leave everything behind, you cannot be my disciple. Let's read it, actually. Over in Luke chapter 14 and verse 31. Jesus says, talking about kings, speaking of kings, or what king going to war, in verse 31, or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and and decide if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not... While the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. You see, Jesus said in a lot of different ways, bottom line, you cannot serve two masters. You will either hate the one or despise the other. There cannot be two kings of your life. Your king cannot be politics. Your king cannot be sports. Your king cannot be your bank account. Your king cannot be yourself. You have to wave the white flag and say, I'm surrendering to your authority. We talk a lot about, you know, the Great Commission. Go make disciples and baptize them, right? We forget that first part in verse 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is Lord. That's what it starts with, this proclamation. And so right now we know, like Byron said, actually we don't know. Who knows what's going to happen this week? I've heard people say, if this guy wins, there's going to be riots and looting. If this guy wins, the economy is going to tank. If this guy wins, World War III is going to break out. If this guy wins, I'm going to lose. You know. We don't know. We do know Jesus is Lord. Doesn't matter who's in the White House. It was, it's very interesting. I used to work at a Christian school over in Missouri. And uh, in 2008, I remember, you know, very crazy election season, a lot like this year. Uh, they, they decided to do a mock vote in the elementary school that I, that I worked at. Um, and so they had, you know, uh, John McCain and Barack Obama. And so uh, all the kids knew this was going to happen all week long. And so it was interesting. Uh, 
uh, talking to the, the principal of the elementary school, she's like, yeah, you know, parents, have, I've, I've heard parents have been telling their kids, okay, this is who you need to vote for when it happens, and put, put you in this box, because at our school, we're going to show that we vote for this person, right? And so the day that they ended up having the election, there were actually three boxes up there. There's one that said John McCain, one that said Barack Obama, and one that said Jesus. It was a unanimous vote, 300 and something to zero, all for Jesus. Is that our same heart? Would you feel that way? And, 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 and be, let's be clear, Jesus would not stoop from being king of the universe to come down and be president. That is beneath him. Let's be clear about that. But are we operating like he is king? Are we operating like he is on the throne? Are we super worried and super frustrated and super concerned and I need to go get my guns because this is going to happen or I need to go, you know, take all my stocks because this is going to happen or I need to go do this because this person might win or this person might win. You know, Pam Hanna put up a post yesterday. I loved it. She said, you know what I'm going to do after the, after the election if my candidate loses? I'm going to go to work, be happy, live my life, love others. If he wins, I'm going to do the same. It reminds me a lot of Philippians 1.26 that says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Contending as one man for the allegiance to the gospel. So this week, Cornerstone, regardless of what happens, Jesus is Lord. Regardless of what happens, Jesus is king. Your happiness cannot be based upon who sits at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Your joy and your peace have to come from who sits on the throne as king of kings and lord of lords, who is the alpha and the omega, who is the lion and the lamb. And if we have truly submitted to the allegiance to this king, whatever comes. It's like we sang in that, that song. I love that song, that wayfaring. Man, we need to start singing that more. That, that was such a, I was like... This is just moving me emotionally. This idea of, man, no matter what comes, this is where I'm going. This is not my home. We are citizens of the kingdom. We are not citizens of this world. And so what I'd like to ask you to do is to be salt and light this week. And the only way we can do that is if we submit it to the king's ethic. We've submitted to the king's example. We've submitted to the king's edict. I like to call for a day of prayer and fasting on Tuesday. I'm going to do it. I'd love for you to join with me if you can. Let's fast and pray for, 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 our, for our leaders, for whoever wins, to, be, to have wisdom. For whoever loses, to concede gracefully. But no matter what, that we will conduct ourselves as if we've given our allegiance to Jesus. You know, in Ephesians, I asked you guys to read that this week. He talks about that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In those times, it's like, you know, the king would have a ring. And when he sent some mail, he would put his seal on it. You knew it was from the king. The Holy Spirit is our seal from the king. That you have, a, you have the tick, you have entrance into heaven. And so what I'd like you to do, we're about to take communion. As you remember the Lord, as you remember his broken body on Calvary, as you remember, his blood spilled out as he was crowned king, not just king of the Jews, but king of the world, right? I'd like you to think about this pledge that I wrote. You don't have to say it. You can say it. I'm going to put this before you. And I'm not saying we need to memorize this and say this every day for the next 13 years. But I do say that every day you need to be saying that proclamation, Jesus is Lord, when you get up. So I'm going to say this, and then we'll have communion. I, Fenton Gardner, pledge allegiance to the king, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and to the kingdom for which he died, one body, indivisible, under God, with liberty and salvation for all who believe. Thank you. Let's have a great Sunday. Amen.